This is part two in our series of lectures on section 4.1, and in this lecture we're going to talk about some special types of functions. The first special function we're going to talk about is known as the inclusion function. It's also known as the identity function. So if A and B are any two sets uh, in which A is a subset of B, then we can define the function f from A to B by each x maps to itself. So whenever we have such a function, we refer to it as the inclusion function, or we also refer to it as the identity function on A. If a function um, has a codomain, which is the set of real numbers, then we refer to it as a real-valued function. So here's an example of a, a real-valued function that's quite important in applications. We call it the characteristic function of a set. So if u is any fixed set and a any subset of u, then the function from u to r, which sends each x in a to 1 and each x outside of a to 0, is called the characteristic function of a, and it's generally denoted with this notation here. So using a more abbreviated notation, chi sub a is the function from u into the set consisting of 0 and 1 by x maps to 1 if x is in A and to 0 if x is not in A. So notice this is a real-valued function, but it's defined on a set u that can be completely abstract. These characteristic functions are used extensively in a subject known as probability theory, which you'll see when you uh, do your Math 351 class, for example. The U um, is there referred to as a sample space of some experiment. The A is referred to as an event. And the chi sub A is what's known as a random variable. And it's interesting to calculate what's known as the expected value of that random variable. So the expected value of that particular random variable is... Um, the probability that that event A actually occurs. So you'll see more of that when you study probability theory in some detail. Another um, interesting class of functions are known as the step functions. and They're also known as simple functions. So suppose we have U as any set can be completely abstract, and suppose we have a partition of U relative to some indexing set delta. You'll remember what it means to say that this family of sets is a partition of U. Um, if we give ourselves any two different elements of the indexing set, I made a small mistake here. I haven't indicated that I and J should be different. If we give ourselves two different elements of our indexing set, then the intersection of the corresponding sets, B, I, and B, J, should be empty. But if you take the union of all of the uh, members of the partition, that should give you of the entire set U. Okay, so to say that it's a partition informally is just to say that we've chopped up our entire set U as a disjoint union of these uh, sets B sub I. So whenever we have such a partition, um, we can define a function as follows. If for each member of the partition we simply give ourselves some real number, B sub I, doesn't matter which one, then we can define the function F from u into r, it's a real-valued function, so that if x is in the b sub i, the ith member of the partition, then we map x to b sub i. So we're making x a certain constant real number on each member of the partition. And we refer to such a function as a step function or a simple function. Here's an example of such a thing. If we take our underlying set to be the closed interval from 0 to 5, and if we define our function piecewise in this way, it's 100 if x is in this interval, etc. Then f is a step function, and the associated partition is what? We're partitioning 0, 5 by this interval, right? We're making f constant on that interval. Then on this open interval here, we're making f equal to this number. And on this member of the partition here, we're making f of x this constant. 
These step functions are the building blocks in a certain area of mathematics which is known as the Lebesgue theory of integration, and more generally the subject known as measure theory. Uh, the Lebesgue theory of integration was developed by Henri Lebesgue at the beginning of the 20th century in order to deal with certain deficiencies in the theory of integration as developed by Riemann. And um, so that turns out to be quite an important area of mathematics in the 20th century. But that's something that you'll come to much later in your studies. Infinite sequences are actually functions uh, having domain set of natural number. If the name of the function is x, we usually use letters like x sub n to denote a particular term in a sequence. Um, rather than denoting the image by x of n, uh, we usually write it as x sub n. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that a sequence isn't a new kind of an object that we've never seen before. It's really a function from the set of natural numbers, um, usually into the set of reals. Sequences are usually real-valued. They're sometimes viewed also as complex-valued functions. And finally, I want to talk about what we mean by the canonical map of an equivalence relation. So if R is any equivalence relation on a set A, then remember we've defined A slash R to denote the set of equivalence classes of this relation. And for each X in A, x slash r is the equivalence class of x. It's the set of all um, y values that are related to x via this relation. So it's very natural to define this mapping which sends, so it's a function from a into a slash r by x maps to its equivalence class relative to this relation. Let's look at a particular example of this. We're going to consider the relation on the set of integers given by x is related to y, provided x is equal to y modulo 3. So remember that relative to this relation, there are exactly three equivalence classes. The equivalence class of 0, the equivalence class of 1, and the equivalence class of 2. The equivalence class of 0, which is, turns out to be this set, it's the set of things of this form, it's the set of all integers with the property that when you divide them by 3, you get a remainder of 0. The equivalence class of 1 turns out to be this set here, it's the set of all integers which when divided by 3 give a remainder of 1, and the equivalence class of 2 turns out to be this, it's the set of all integers of this form, and they are the set of integers which, when divided by 3, leave a remainder of 2. So those three sets give us a partition of the set of all integers. So z slash r denotes the set of all equivalence classes. That's given by this set here. And as I've indicated above, the canonical mapping is the mapping from z into z slash r, given by we map x to its equivalence class x bar. Uh, notice that I made a little typo here. That's supposed to have a little vertical line before the arrow. Now, so notice um, that this function is set valued. So for example, what would be the image of the number 0? Zero? 0 would map to this entire set, 0 bar. And what would be the image of, say, 3? Three? 3 maps to 3 bar. And what is 3 bar? Well, 3 lies in this equivalence class here, therefore 3 bar and 0 bar are exactly the same. So, basically, um, every integer maps to either 0 bar, 1 bar, or 2 bar, because every integer lies in exactly one of those three equivalence classes. So, as I said, notice that it is a set-valued function. So you're going to have a look at these canonical mappings a great deal when you do your abstract algebra class. Um, at GMU, that's Math 321, uh, and the graduate version of that is Math 621.